Here we are at Semina Sleep Systems in Pasadena, California. I wanted to do a video about sleep, but then I wanted to niche it down even further because we all know sleep is the number one health practice you can have, right? But there's a couple different components to your sleep. You have dietary, you have supplementation, then you have your sleep environment, right? So you know you want a really dark room, a cold room, you want a room with some plants. There's all kinds of different things that we'll cover in another video. But what I really wanted to address specifically was the actual sleep system. Like what are you using for your bedding? And a lot of people don't realize the bedding they're using is, well, suboptimal is not even like, it's, it's much worse than suboptimal in most cases. So we're going to the top of the food chain here. And we are dealing with literally, in my opinion at least, the healthiest bed in the world. So it's not just a, mass, a mattress, it really is a whole sleep system. Okay, so why do I think this particular bed is the healthiest bed in the world? Well, it's the whole concept. It's a very like highly conceptualized sleep system and it's based on the idea of taking all the principles of nature and bringing them into the bedroom. So it's way past organic. In fact, in terms of the actual construction, that the bed is made from, all the stuff it's made from, it's made by European standards which are even higher than US standards. So it's like, if you think about like biodynamic food versus organic food, this would be like the biodynamic bed. So it's super crazy healthy and it's just scientifically mind boggling. So that's kind of the premise of Semina beds and that's what we're gonna talk about. So these beds have been around since 1989. The guy that invented them is this genius from Austria. So the beds are all made in Austria still to this day. And he was a, well, is a doctor and a psychologist. And he realized as he was treating people that a lot of people's issues that they were having psychologically could be traced back to actual sleep issues. So he thought, ah, Bing, how can I make the world's healthiest bed to assist people not only to be healthy physically, but healthy mentally and emotionally. So this bed is actually modeled after the human body. So it's a four layer system. We're gonna go in in a second here and break down the four different layers piece by piece. But as you can see, it's a unique looking bed. As a, and as we start to dig it apart a little bit and uncover some of this, it gets deeper and more crazy as we go. So this is a cross cut of the human body, the whole bed itself. So what we're gonna start with, of course, is the skeleton, right? And that's what we have here, which is the frame that you sleep on, which would actually take the place of a box ring. And you can see it's a totally open air system, which I'm gonna talk about later, has to do with ventilation and cooling and wicking away moisture. But this skeleton mimics the human spine. So you've got these natural rubber sort of vertebrae in between what would be your spine or even your ribs. And they all move independently, each one. It's just this fantastic system. It's also really cool because if you're sleeping with someone in the bed, you each have an independent sort of spring system so the bed never sinks. It's totally insane. So when you lay on what would be the skeleton or the spine, wherever I'm putting pressure, the bed's going to sink in. Your spine goes into this S contour, which is really not possible with any other mattress. So like every part of my spine is totally supported right here because each little sort of spine works independently within its vertebrae or each rib, I guess you could say too. It's like, it just responds to your movement. It's just absolutely fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about what happens in a normal bed, right? In a normal bed, you don't have a skeleton like this. What you usually have is a box spring, which is gonna be made out of who knows what kind of wood. It may have been treated. It's probably got glue and it's made with other synthetic things that off gas. Not an ideal situation, but let's talk about the old school mattress. So first off, you've got metal springs and those are kind of, <laughs> unfortunately, um, gonna draw in EMFs and electronic fields and crap like that that you don't want to sleep in and it acts as an antenna So that's the first issue then you have fire retardants There's even laws in different states in the country at least in the United States about having to use fire retardants Especially with children's bedding and things like that fire retardants are essentially Formaldehyde and those off gas and you breathe those in for a third of your life, which really sucks, okay? You also have like petrochemicals, like oil-based things that are um, used to manufacture the box springs. And then you have the issue of moisture getting trapped. So this is like an open system like we saw, right? So it's totally open underneath, whereas when you have a box spring, there's no airflow. And so what happens is 
moisture gets trapped and moisture breeds dust mites. And we're gonna talk about dust mites at a couple points in the video, but dust mites are super nasty. It's not the mites that you gotta worry about, it's the mite shit, okay? <laughs> dust mites, you know, they make a lot of, a lot of deweys, okay? And what happens is <laughs> that stuff ends up in your mattress and it gets trapped inside there because of the moisture. So it's like a perfect home. If you wanted to have like, think of an ant farm, right? An ant farm, you put sand in, it's got the glass and you can see them making their little home. Well, a closed system, typical like bo box spring and mattress is like an ant farm for dust mites. And it's not even so much an ant farm, it's like a dust mite poop farm where they're just in a perfect environment to create poop and that leads to allergies and all sorts of stuff which we'll talk about. So that's the difference between a normal mattress and, bo and box spring and this system which I'm in love with. The other cool thing about the skeleton system here versus a regular box spring is as I said, this allows your spine to have a perfect S curve. What happens is when your body isn't able to have something underneath it re that responds, you get these little uh, pinched nerves. And every time you get a pinched nerve, that sort of activates your nervous system into wanting to move around. And so you could have a healthy night's sleep where you move around 70 times, or you could have an unhealthy night's sleep with these pinched nerves and pressure points that you get where you're waking up a couple hundred times, sometimes a few hundred. So this is what causes that tossing and turning. And I know myself at home, if I'm sleeping on a normal mattress, normal <laughs> mattress, what's normal is usually sucks is the thing. It's like conventional food. Why would you eat conventional food when you could eat organic food? It's the same kind of thing. What happens with me is if I sleep on my side, I'll wake up and my whole hand is numb and that's what's happening. I'm having these pressure points because the mattress is not responding to the pressure in the various parts of my body. And so when you have the natural rubber sort of vertebrae, as you could say here, allowing your body to move naturally, you don't get those pressure points, you don't get those pinched nerves. And this of course is also uh, makes it a lot easier to sleep with a couple because if I'm on this side and someone else is on this side, if I'm, you know, what am I now, 185, 90 pounds, and the person next to me is 120 pounds, that means that they're having a different level of pressure than I am. And so I want something that individually stabilizes my skeletal system by having a skeletal system underneath me that's flexible. It's pretty dope. All right, so we talked about the skeleton, right? That's the first part of the human body that the bed mimics. Next, we're gonna talk about part two, which is joints, muscles, and tissue, right? And so here was our skeleton, right? Remember this guy? And then next, we're gonna talk about the actual mattress. And this is the soft part, just like this is the hard part of our body, and your flesh is the soft part. Same here, this is the flesh of the bed, which of course is like next level organic cotton, and natural, totally natural rubber inside here. I wish you could feel it. It's so goddamn comfortable. <laughs> it's super awesome. Okay, so why do we want something so soft and responsive under us? Again, this goes back to the pressure points and those pinched nerves. It also dissipates heat. This natural material allows breathability. When you're hot and you overheat, that kills your sleep. It all goes back to nature, right? Remember I said in the beginning, what we're doing here with the Samina bed is we're taking the outside environment and recreating that indoors. So we're going back in time. Imagine like hunter-gatherer time. You're sleeping outdoors and usually it's cold, right? Depending on where you are in terms of the equator. So we don't wanna be hot. We get our most restful deep sleep when we're actually cooling down at night. And if you have a breathability, this allows that to happen because of the airflow. So in this system, you've got an open air system, right? And so what happens is your body dissipates heat and where does heat go? Heat rises and then cool air, you know in the winter, like when you heat your room, it's always really hot up here, but down on the floor, it's cold, right? So your human body heat, you're like a human radiator, that heat rises and then the cold air actually comes up through these slats and through the natural uh, rubber mattress. So that's what's going on in the next layer of the bed, just like the layer of your human body. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the next part of the human body, your bioelectrical system. So this has to do with your heart and your cells. That's the electricity in your body. The bed also addresses the electrical system. It's crazy. Okay, so 
You guys may have heard of earthing or grounding, right? This is where you touch your bare skin, like say walking on the beach or in the forest uh, on some grass. You know that good feeling you get? Well, it has to do with the fact that you're being grounded. So your body discharges static electricity and you're uptaking negative ions. Negative sounds bad, and, and you know, n normally in the context of our language, negative is bad. Negative ions are good. It's some sciencey shit, don't worry about it. Point is, you want to be connected with the earth. Think about grounding and earthing like this. Our entire existence as this species that we are now, these meat suits that we walk around in, or these meat puppets, as <laughs> someone called it the other day on my podcast, uh, have always been in contact with the earth or with some natural fibers like this, like merino wool and cotton that's touching the earth. So as we've evolved, we were not sleeping on metal box springs. We weren't sleeping in the 42nd story of some building disconnected from the earth. We're always connected to the earth even when we sleep. And we used to have, before rubber shoes, right, we had leather-soled shoes and different types of shoes before the advent of petroleum-based rubber and plastic and things that we walk around in now. So my point is this. If you look at any animal in nature, so any you know, land animal, any sea, water animal, amphibians, reptiles, even birds, I would say, I don't, I, I don't know this to be a fact, but maybe not the majority of a bird's life, but a lot of times birds aren't flying, they're chilling somewhere, right? They're like on a tree, they're on the ground, they're grounded. So anytime a living creature's skin is touching the ground or some water or another living thing such as a tree, it's grounded. So every living thing has evolved to be connected to the Earth's electrical field. The Earth is electric and magnetic, right? So when we sleep, what we're doing is we're disconnecting ourselves from the planet. And these meat suits that we have are meant to be connected to the planet. And so this grounding system, what's really cool about it is it does that so effectively. And I'm going to explain how it does that. Now, normally, like you have a grounding sheet, like I travel with the grounding sheet. It goes on the foot of my bed, plugs in the wall like this. So it plugs in the ground of the wall in every building, at least in this country, hopefully, if they're following code, there's a wire in that little third hole in the wall, in that plug, you have like two holes right here and then one in the middle. That middle one's the grounding wire, right? So that goes down through a ground wire, down the building, I don't care if you're in New York City on the 100th floor, and that goes down into the earth, and there's a metal spike that goes way down into the ground, and then that comes up in the wall, and then you're plugging that in. However, with a normal grounding sheet, like the earthing stuff that's available out there, I mean, it's better than nothing. Like I said, I travel with one. But the issue is, is the amount of silver, like how conductive it is. So typically you're looking at like 5% silver, and silver is the most conductive metal in the world. It's actually, um, what is it, uh, 10 times more conductive than a human body. So silver is awesome, and I'm going to show you the silver that's in here. These are 75% silver. So the idea is that you want to be touching metal with your skin that's touching metal in the wall, that's touching the ground down in the ground. But the problem is with normal grounding is not only that it's less conductive because there's like such a minuscule amount of silver. Why? Because it's expensive, obviously, right? That's why grounding sheets are 100 bucks, and one of these is like $3,000. There's a lot of actual silver in there. The other issue is you're having direct contact, contact with the metal. And there's issues there with you uptaking what's called dirty electricity from the wall. So I don't know. To me, I'd still rather sleep grounded on a normal grounding mat um, or grounding pad or sheet than not. But there's like a little bit of debate out there as to whether or not you're going to uptake dirty electricity, which obviously is bad electricity from the wall because some of these circuits get crossed and I don't know, it's just kind of weird. Uh, so with this particular method of grounding, your skin isn't actually touching the metal mesh part here. Your skin is touching the cotton and the wool. And so what's happening is you're getting that conductivity through your skin and the moisture going through the wool and then that's touching this highly saturated really like thick silver thread and you're super super grounded so it's like if you wanted to be the ultimate grounded human you would get in water so when you go in the ocean you can't get any more grounded than that the next best thing would be this 
because you have the moisture and you have the natural fibers, but you don't have any of the negative effects of directly touching your skin to the metal grounding. I know this shit's geeky, but honestly, it's really good to know. If you're gonna go eventually for like what I think's the best bed in the world is you really wanna know this stuff and think about it. And that's just something that I'm passionate about, as you can tell. I love this stuff, but you kinda get down the rabbit hole and it gets a little bit crazy. So the other thing about the bioelectrical system of your body and why the grounding thing is so important, it has to do with EMF. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more of what those are. And just to give you the background, when the metal spring mattress was invented, right, which is the weird thing is <laughs> there's companies now that sell metal spring mattresses, which is like the worst technology ever for the age we live in. They sell them for up to $100,000. I mean, these beds are expensive, but like, honestly, I think there's one called um, Hastings or something. Google it. And it's crazy expensive, but they still have metal springs. The issue with the metal springs is that, as I said earlier, they attract all of these negative EMF fields, which I'm going to explain what those are. But when metal spring mattresses were invented, it was no big. Why? Because we didn't have smart meters, cell towers. So all this dirty electricity, all these signals coming in from every direction is what we have to mitigate. That's what we have to really work out by using this high quality grounding, right? So any grounding's better than none, but this crazy level of grounding is really important. And I'm gonna explain the three types of fields that we're now encountering in the modern world. And the reason we really wanna be mindful of the EMF issue is because when we sleep, that's when our body is most vulnerable. Think of your body's electrical system and our whole immune system as having an on and off switch, right? So when you wake up and you're full of cortisol, which is like the awake hormone and adrenaline and all these things, testosterone, all the stuff that's helping us get out there and get shit done in the world, you're sort of protected because your body's got an on switch. You're not as susceptible to outside influences and um, things like that. So when you're sleeping, this is the time when your body shuts down its natural defenses and your body has its off switch clicked, right? So this is when our body's going, okay, cool, we're safe, we're going to rest now, and we're getting hammered with all of these fields. Okay, so what are EMFs? Electromagnetic frequencies. And really now we could call them REMFs for radio electromagnetic frequencies because a lot of it is radio waves. So let's talk about the electricity. This is the electricity running through your wall. So if you have a lamp next to your bed, if your iPhone's plugged in next to your bed, anything like that is going to create a field that is harmful to your biology. Again, just think in nature. In nature, are we harnessing lightning and sleeping next to it? No, we're not, okay? The next one is magnetic. So there's a magnetic field that's harmful to us, which is created by typically by motors. So if you think about a refrigerator or something that's got a big condenser and a big motor, Motor, it's wrapped in copper and that's emitting a magnetic frequency. The next one we're going to look out for, the third, is the radio frequencies. And radio frequencies are something that are relatively new. Like if you think about an AM radio transmitting to your little radio, that's a radio frequency, but the signal is very subtle. When we get into cell phones, cell towers, uh, smart meters, cordless phones, things like that, these radio frequencies are highly disruptive to your biology. And a lot of people discount this as woo-woo, but if you do your research, just Google like cancer plus cell phone towers and you're gonna trip out at what you find. Google disease plus smart meters and start digging around, do your own research, okay? As you know, like watching these videos, I'm not a scientist, I'm just picking it up from a layman's point of view, conveying what I know to you. Please do your own research. But those are the three types of frequencies that we're, we're dealing with here. And when you sleep, as I said, you're more susceptible to anything that's going to disrupt your normal biology, your hormones, your circadian rhythm, and ultimately just ruin your sleep, right? You wanna be sleeping in a natural environment. So when we're grounding in such an efficient way, we're diminishing the negative effects of all this stuff coming at us while we sleep. Okay, so moving on with the issue of EMF. So we have the electromagnetic field, we have the radio frequencies, and then we have the magnetic field. So I'm gonna cover the magnetic field. And again, like everything I always do, you guys, I'm giving you a simplistic version, all right? I'm not a scientist, I'm gonna say that over and over again. This is my understanding of it. I can just see the comments on YouTube from electrical engineers calling me names. This is the basic deal, okay? 
If you just go back to nature, how was it a thousand years ago when we were hunter-gatherers? Were we exposed to all these negative fields? No, we were not. We only had a positive magnetic field being produced by the Earth. Now we're surrounded by all of this, you know, unnatural, um, non-native EMFs, as they call it, right? So on to the one that I'm covering now specifically is the magnetic fields. Now you kind of have like the good and the bad of magnetic fields. So let's talk about the negative magnetic fields, right? This is what's coming out of your wires in the wall. This is what's coming off power lines, your refrigerator, when you have compressors, engines, things like that. Now those are balanced out by positive magnetic fields which come off of the planet itself. So again, going back to ancient times, we were walking around barefoot, we were sleeping on the ground with some sort of natural cotton or wool fibers between us and the earth. Now we're living in high rises where the Earth's magnetic field is much further from you. So ideally, like if you wanted to be a truly natural and healthy human, you'd sleep as close as possible to the ground. Now we're gonna hack that. Samina beds have something really unique and they have a, mag a magnet system, which I'm gonna cover, which actually creates the magnetic field that's missing from the planet. Now there's a lot of um, speculation as to why the Earth's magnetic field is diminishing, but basically at this point it's almost gone. Um, some are saying that the axis of the Earth is going into its natural reversal, could have something to do with that. There are other theories that the way that we build buildings with concrete and iron is affecting the magnetic field. There's also a lot of um, information out there about cell phone towers and just all of the electro pollution on the planet that that's disrupting the field. I don't know, but it's definitely an undisputed fact that that natural magnetic field, which is so healthy for us, is being diminished. And so now we're gonna show how having a special series of magnets inside the mattress actually helps to reduce the harmful effects of that bad magnetic frequency and how it enhances and increases the positive. Okay, so now we're gonna take a deeper look into the element of grounding. I've got a skin voltage meter here which measures the millivolts that my skin is conducting and we're gonna do an ungrounded, which means this thing's not plugged in, the sheet itself is not plugged into the ground in the wall, and then we're gonna do it plugged in, so we'll show both ways. Now when we do this stuff, you gotta understand, I'm just some schmo, I'm not an electrician, I'm not trained in these things, I'm just looking at the meter, which we're gonna show you close up, I'm seeing what's happening, and I have a basic understanding that I want less millivolts going through my body coming out of the atmosphere. So this is electrosmog or EMFs that we're dealing with, and the grounding pad in this particular bed being full of silver, as I explained, is actually minimizing the exposure that I have. Now in the building that we're in, it's not properly grounded because, I don't know, it's an old building built in the 20s and an electrician hasn't been in here. So what we're gonna show is the number is significantly higher when the grounding pad is not plugged into the wall and then we plug in the grounding pad and I'm laying on it as I would be sleeping, it drops way down, but you have to understand it would drop all the way to zero or 100, which is essentially zero if this building was grounded. So unfortunately our little experiment today was a little bit skewed, but we'll show you the vast difference in numbers even with a building that's ungrounded, which is pretty cool. So with the skin voltage meter, my skin is touching this, which is plugged into the actual meter. And right now I'm ungrounded, meaning that the grounding pad is not plugged into the ground outlet in the wall. And we're looking at 14,000, just about late 13,000, 14,000 millivolts that my body's getting just from being in this environment in the middle of the city. And then we're gonna show how that number significantly drops once the grounding pad is actually plugged in. This end goes out to the wall and this end here goes into the actual grounding pad that way. So now we're gonna test it with the safety precaution element on. Okay, so we've plugged in the grounding pad on the Samina and now I'm getting a totally different number. It's crazy, that number dropped from 14,000 millivolts on my skin to 1,700. So that's a significant drop and as I said, if this building that we're in was properly grounded, that number would drop to zero or even a hundred, which is basically non-existent. So this is the field that I'm getting just from being in this environment, and this is how much I'm being protected from that. So you can see I'm at like 1690, 1700 millivolts versus 14,000. It's a crazy drop just from touching my jeans, my shirt, my skin on this grounding pad.
Okay, so the second type of EMF we're going to talk about is radio frequencies, and this crazy contraption here measures the microwatts per square meter. So what you're looking for is a lower number and less sound. I have the sound turned off right now. I'm going to turn the sound on and see just how much radio frequency interference we're getting here. Again, this is harmful to your biology. This is scientifically proven. You can Google effects of this would be like Wi-Fi and cell towers and smart meters and gnarly stuff like that. So this is the worst um, comparatively between the electro smog that you'd get and the magnetic issues. So this one's the radio frequencies. We've got a live cell phone here. It's not on airplane mode. It's on. So we're going to turn this on. And this is just the ambient sound that we're getting from the environment. Not the sound, but you know, the actual pollution. And watch what happens when the cell phone gets closer. This is not good, y'all. So continuing on with the radio frequencies, I'm now standing right next to the router in this building, okay, the Wi-Fi router. I just want to preface this by saying whether or not you have grounding sheets, a grounding pad, a Samina bed, whatever you have, I would highly recommend that you put your router on a timer. That's what I do at home so it goes off at night while I'm sleeping. Never have the router close to your bed, close to your head. I've seen people like in New York when they have these small studio apartments, the router will be like next to their nightstand. I'm like, dude, and you're going to see why in a second. That's really, really bad. So protect yourself with grounding if possible, but if not, at least turn your router off or even better, just hardwire your apartment or house and don't even use Wi-Fi unless you absolutely need it. So here's what's going to happen. This thing's on already. I'm about to turn the volume up. We see a number one here, which means this damn meter is maxed out of milliwatts. It can't even compute how much radiation, you know, like when you have cancer, you get radiation. Yeah, radiation is being produced. So you saw it when I put the cell phone next to it, that number went to one, right? Same thing's happening here because we're really close to the router, which I'm about to reveal. So watch what happens when I turn the sound up here. This is not good. This is no bueno. And we go behind the curtain here. This thing just absolutely freaks out. Now listen, that said, you gotta live your life. I'm not gonna walk around in fear and be paranoid of all the radio waves. It's not about being paranoid, you guys. It's just about being educated and mitigating these things when you can. Listen, if I go traveling, I stay in a hotel, I look at my phone to get a Wi-Fi signal and there's like 45 signals on full blast, five bars. It's like, you just gotta surrender. There's nothing you can really do about it. But in your home, if you can sleep grounded, if you can turn off your router at night, anything you can do just habitually to minimize this stuff is really going to have a major impact on your health, especially if you have kids that are still developing. If you have small pets, uh, smaller creatures tend to be more susceptible to these things than larger. Just imagine like putting your cell phone next to an elephant. It's probably not going to hurt them as bad as it would your little six pound chihuahua. You know, so think about your babies, your kids, your pets and yourself, but especially when sleeping. Okay, so carrying on with the EMF issue. As I said, we have three different types of EMFs we're working with. We've got the electromagnetic, we've got the radio frequencies, and then we've got the magnetic fields. So now I'm gonna talk about the magnetic fields. There's a couple different things with that. It gets a little bit geeky, but just I'm gonna give you the layman's, you know, common guy version of it, because that's the only way I can understand it and explain it. You have two things going on. You have the Earth's magnetic field, which is good. That's positive. That's what we're supposed to have as biological creatures living on the surface of this planet. So if the Earth's magnetic field is disturbed, how are we going to correct that using a bed? And that is through the use of magnets. So inside the grounding pad, what really makes this bed just freaking crazy is it's got magnets inside it that actually change the magnetic field while you sleep on it. It's bananas. So. If you go online and you do some research, you'll find an overwhelming amount of information that states that not only has the Earth's magnetic field diminished severely over the past couple hundred years, actually it just keeps getting worse and worse, but when you sleep, it's highly recommended that you sleep with your head to the north and your feet to the south. Now there's a lot of research on this. There's a bit of debate. Uh, the Asian part of the world tends to think east-west, whereas the Europeans tend to think north-south. I've found more data and more sort of supporting evidence for the north-south benefit. So what does that do when you sleep with your bed or your head facing the north, true north? What that does is it entrains your brain into different brain waves, specifically delta brain waves, which are the brain waves responsible for very deep sleep. 
So we're going to show you how to sort of hack what direction you're facing so you don't have to move your damn bed. My bed at home, I know right now I'm thinking about it, my head is directly south and my feet face toward the north because that's the only way my stupid giant bed fits in my particular bedroom. So I'm going to have to get one of these in order to reverse that if I really want to be optimal and be in alignment with nature. After all, you guys, it's all about trying to use technology to mimic nature so we can still live in the city and live a modern life and be normal and not have to live like out in a cabin in the woods with no electricity. All right, so I'm going to show you how this compass and the magnets work together to reverse the direction and polarity while you're sleeping. Okay, so what I've got here is a good old-fashioned compass, and this compass is pointing to true north. So you can see that little red arrow is pointing that way. That's because that way is the mountains. We're in Pasadena, and that's a mountain range called the Angeles Crest Forest, and it's pointing right up there. It's one of my favorite places to go. Now, what if our bed is not facing the correct direction? So this bed here looks like the head is facing west and the feet are facing east, which is not optimal. So I'm going to show you how the magnets inside the grounding pad actually change the magnetic field. They change the polarity while you sleep. It's bananas. Check this out. Okay, so here we go. You can see it's still pointing north. Now there's strips of magnets inside this grounding pad. And as we start to pull this down, you see that now the head of the bed where the pillow is, is true north which is created by the magnetic field in the grounding pad. So that's south, that's north, when in reality, in the room, the bed isn't so situated. It's pretty amazing. So you can see as we cross over these magnets, that magnetic field has been changed. Okay, now we're going to talk about the next layer of the sleep system, which mimics the human body, and that's the skin. So we're going to go into all of the mattress and the bedding, comforters, pillows, all that stuff. So what we're working with here is totally organic cotton, untreated cotton and merino wool. But we got to go deeper into the wool because our little buddy sheep here <laughs> is a very important piece of this puzzle when it comes to truly natural organic bedding, okay? So we're talking about merino wool. And one of the main features of merino wool is that it wicks, it wicks away moisture. So when you sleep, you're breathing and sweating up to a half liter of moisture every night. And if that moisture, which is what we have in the glass here, it's about a half a liter, that's what you're expelling every night. And that goes into your bedding. And when you're using inferior bedding that doesn't wick away that moisture, what happens is that soaks into your mattress, into your blankets, and is basically becomes food for dust mites. So the dust mite issue is huge because that's where all the allergies and stuff come from. So the average mattress can build up to seven pounds of dust mite feces per year. So merino wool prevents that from wicking away, but it also has something called lanolin in it. And lanolin is an oil that's secreted by the animal and gets into their fur, and dust mites hate lanolin. Now what Samina does that's really cool is their sheep all are totally free range and free roaming and all they do is produce wool so they don't even eat these particular animals that come from the Alps in um, Austria, right? So there's a couple interesting things they do. So the animals are free range but they also only use the needle wool which is the top of the animal and the needle wool contains the most lanolin because it soaks up the most sun. It's crazy. I mean this stuff gets very deep and esoteric but it's really true. There's the most oil in what's called the needle wool, and that's the only wool that's used for all these mattresses and all of the bedding that we're going to be talking about, the comforters and all that stuff. Now, another thing that's unique about our Austrian <laughs> friends over at Samina is that they're very kind to the animals. Now, if you Google a video by Pink, she talks about, you know, she's very into PETA and animal rights and all that. She talks about how sheep are so horribly abused by the wool industry. They'll take a whole animal like this, this size sheep, right? And they have these shears, sort of like imagine if you go in the military and they shave your head. They lift them up in these sort of um, wenches and they have these electric razors and they just zip, 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 and they shave them in seven seconds. So imagine shearing this entire animal bald in seven seconds. When they do that, in that particular practice, which is pretty widespread, oftentimes the animals get cut and oftentimes they actually get arteries severed and bleed out and die just from being sheared inhumanely. So, 
you know, these things are important. You don't want bad karma in your bed. I mean, I eat meat. You know, I try to do it in an ethical way. Hopefully the farms that I'm working with directly treat the animals with respect. Same goes for bedding and all that. So this is kind of like the fur industry when you're talking about merino wool. It gets a little bit sketchy. So that's another thing I really like about this. I don't want to abuse this guy. I just want to use his wool so I cannot be eating seven pounds of dust mite shit every year. Okay, so more lanolin on the sheep's wool means less dust mites. Less dust mites means better sleep, less allergies. Okay, so carrying on with the skin of the bed, we've kind of created a context for how important the correct type of merino wool is and just all natural materials. So let's talk about some of the other materials you want to look out for just in terms of your bedding, no matter what kind of bed you have. Uh, this would have to do with your pillows, blankets, sheets, comforters. First, you want to avoid synthetic materials such as fillers. Like here we've got the merino wool filler. Imagine if this was made of petrochemicals or some other nasty stuff, so you want to avoid that. You also want to avoid down. Now think about down. When you're a kid, your mom's like, oh, we're going to get you down pillows and down comforters. And you think, well, mom said to do it, so it must be right. Listen, mommy and granny and daddy, they weren't always right. There's a lot of outdated uh, information that they were working with, okay? Here's what sucks about down, okay? We covered synthetics. Down is not good for a number of different reasons. A, it absorbs heat. So think about a goose or a duck, right? They have all these puffy feathers around them, and that's to retain heat. When you're sleeping, dog, you don't want to retain heat. You want to expel heat. That's why you want a bedding system that allows heat to dissipate so you don't overheat and have your sleep interrupted. So that's the first thing. Second thing with down is it's very allergenic meaning that it's really bad for dust mites. It harbors a lot of dust mites, and a lot of people are just allergic to feathers. It puts off a lot of particulate into the air, and it's just like not a hygienic material. It's natural, so it sounds good, but it kind of sucks, okay? Also, when you have bedding that doesn't wick away moisture, that soaks up moisture, the issue you have is the infestation of mold. So it's not only the dust mites, it's the mold. So I'm not a fan of down bedding or synthetic bedding, super into organic cotton and merino wool. Okay, so when it comes to comforters, there's a couple things you wanna be aware of. A is we wanna avoid synthetics and downs, right? So we've got that. But let's talk about the actual construction of them. Most comforters are made with little square pockets, right? If you can picture your comforter that you're sleeping with right now, it probably has that. What I like about these is that they're just one big piece. You can see the merino wool inside here, right? And they're just tacked down. They just have these little bits of hand-sewn thread that keep it from bunching up. Now what sucks when you have those square pockets is those become safe havens for dust mites. They become dust mite little factories or cities. So each square kind of retains that moisture which feeds the dust mites. Dust mites eat two things, your sweat and your dead skin. So they feed, they come out and feed in the bed, then they retreat back into their little apartment building, which is those squares in your comforter, that's not good. Those are also very susceptible to mold. So it has a lot to do with the construction. You want bedding and blankets and comforters that really breathe, right? You also don't want cold spots. And cold spots are created when you have that square. I wish I had one here, but imagine we have a square here and there's um, threads sewn in between each square. What happens is, the down or even the wool in a comforter that's constructed that way will shift to one side and so you have like an empty corner of one of those little pockets and that creates what's called a cold spot. So you have a blanket that's nice and thick but there's all these sort of holes where the heat can evaporate while you're sleeping which totally sucks. Now this part I'm really excited about. We covered the comforter and the bedding and the mattress and all the other stuff and all the materials but these pillows are super sick. This is the kind of pillow I've been sleeping with and I've gone on a couple trips and I've forgotten my pillow and had to sleep with some weird down, like just gross hotel pillow. It is not cute. So this is, I actually have a list of things when I take a trip and I have like Samina pillow, don't forget it. I bring it on the plane, I bring it everywhere. I'm like a little kid with his blankie. What's dope about this particular pillow is you have natural rubber insert inside here, right? Which is super squishy and it sort of, it's very buoyant. It bounces back. So when you squish it, it kind of goes back to its shape. But what's really rad about this pillow is that you can see from the cross cut here 
that it's thicker on one end. So what it does is it fills in that space under your neck. So like when you lie on your side, you often get a sore neck, or I do at least if I'm on a normal pillow, because there's no support for my neck. So the way this pillow is actually just shaped and the way that it's layered gives you a lot of neck support when you sleep. Now I'm a side sleeper for the most part, so it kind of just fills in this space right here so that I'm not like smashing my shoulder and smashing my neck. So these pillows are just super, super cool. They're my favorite pillows in the world. And of course they're made with, you know, natural rubber, um, organic cotton, and the merino wool that I've been talking about versus things that create allergies. And you know, if you're, if you're gonna do anything for your bed, let me just say this, at least get a totally organic, untreated, no formaldehyde, no flame retardants. You don't want anything unnatural on your pillow because you have to think about, like your nose is right here, right? Let me demo this. Here's my nose all night long <laughs> and I'm breathing in whatever's off gassing off that pillow. So if anything in your bed is gonna be natural, at least start with the pillow and then work your way up. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is the actual bed frame. Now me personally, I'm super into aesthetics. I'm into interior design. I was in fashion for 17 years. So the way something looks to me is really important. Not just to impress other people, it's just like when I walk in my room, I want shit to look dope. I can't, it's just the way I am. Like I'm really into design and furniture and stuff. So Samina beds are rad because they're healthy, but they don't look stupid. A lot of things in the health world, whether it's like the logos and branding on like some vitamins or just different health and biohacking technology, oftentimes the design is sort of lost in the function. But what's cool about Samina is they have the function and the design. So you have this beautiful wood, which is all made by a master cabinet maker. Now you can use your own bed. Like for mine, I have a great frame already. So I'll just pop one of these beds in there and it can be made to measure and sort of custom built on an existing bed in most cases. But I do like their um, woodwork because it's so well made and it doesn't have any metal. When you're dealing with like most bed frames, they're going to have metal bars, rods, screws, and things like that, which are conductive and add to that, that negative magnetic field, right? The electromagnetics, the EMF. So you don't want metal in your bed, whether it's springs or just the construction of the bed. Like to me, those, remember those like old metal bed frames with wheels on them? I don't know, they're like always in the spare room at grandma's house or whatever, <laughs> those really nasty beds. I don't wanna sleep on metal because I don't wanna sleep on a giant antenna. We've seen with those meters that I showed you guys, all of the crazy fields that are going around. Again, I don't wanna be paranoid, but I'd rather sleep on something that's solid wood. The other issues, even with wood beds, are all of the varnishes. So this is just sanded completely smooth. It's beautiful. I wish you could feel how this feels. It's just like fantastic, beautiful wood. But if wood has varnish or paint or glue, it off gases and over time you're breathing that in. Like think about when you get a cheap dresser from Ikea and you put it together and you put it in your room. Have you ever noticed when you walk in the room and you haven't been in there for a while, it smells like glue and chemicals? Especially if you've been in a home where the air is purified and you have ionizers like I do. And like if something's funky in my house, I smell it right away. So you want to avoid glues and varnishes and these kind of things that create volatile organic compounds or VOCs, just like the paint in your bedroom can do as well. So you want a no VOC environment and having no VOC construction on your furniture, including your bed, will assist you in that. Another thing that's really cool about the construction of the frames at Samina is that all of the wood that they use is replanted. That's the thing, like when you buy wood furniture sometimes, you're like, ah, oh, shit, was a forest cut down for this? Well, the forests that are cut down for Samina woodwork for their beds are actually replanted, so it's a totally renewable source of wood, which is cool. So as we near the close of this video, I just want to remind you how important sleep is. You know, whether or not you end up with one of these beds or some other type of natural bed, it's all about making incremental steps to just improve your quality of life. That's what my podcast is about, The Lifestylist. That's about all of the information I share through videos and anything I write, everything I put out to you guys is to just improve your life. So even if you do it incrementally, little at a time, you start with a natural pillow and you clean the air in your bedroom, you get some plants, you make it dark, you make it cold, anything you can do to improve your sleep. But the actual stuff that you're sleeping on and in is really important. So I want you guys to really work toward doing that. And in closing, I'd like to just 
leave you with this sort of paradigm shift, and that is your sleep time doesn't have to be wasted time. I know in my life I think about, oh man, I gotta get eight hours sleep, I could be doing something productive, and it's kind of a pain in the ass to actually <laughs> lose that part of your life. That's a third of your life. That's one third of your life spent sleeping. How about if we can be lazy and sleep but be getting something done? So what can you get done while you're sleeping? If you have the proper sleep environment and the proper bedding, you can actually optimize your sleep and use that as a regenerative, restorative time so it's not passive. You're laying there thinking you're doing nothing, but you're allowing your body, given the right environment, to actually regenerate and restore itself. So let's rethink about the way we approach sleep and bedding.